you know, it was a, a, a journey into the unknown, as it were, because we're... I'll say that again. <laughs> See? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I just got the, the, the tune in my head. It's going to go my way. <laughs> I've got no idea who that was supposed to be, but never mind. Neither have I. I think I'm <laughs> caught between James Brown and Aerosmith there. <laughs> well, I was actually thinking that you were talking about Lenny Kravitz, but there you go. That's who it was. <laughs> I knew it was somebody. Yeah, again, one of the worst impersonations you've ever heard in your life. Well, it wasn't meant to have been impersonation, but... Oh, know. right, OK. <laughs> right, on you go. Get absolutely crucified for it, and that's 2-0 to Aberdeen, bastards. Sorry, Derek, for saying that. You'll have to ed- edit that out. Sorry, mate. <laughs> we'll say, say, we'll say... There was no, no. no any... Um, what's the word? I forgot the word. Pen- penetration? Don't you talk to him about that? <laughs> yeah, that got your folks and welcome to season 5 episode 1 of the iReady podcast. As ever, I'm your host Derek and with me is my co-host Dave. Good evening Derek, how are you? I'm very good, how's yourself? Uh, not too bad Derek, we've had a, a couple of weeks uh, to sort of calm down slightly uh, just with everything that's been happening but uh, we'll get into that in very shortly I'm sure. Calm down, you fucked off the Blackpool. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Just, um, uh, do you know this is a, a special podcast today as well? Not only is it the first episode of season five, yes, we've been going for this, is our fifth year. Five this, seasons. My this God. is also our 50th ever episode. Quality! 50th. We should have had some sort of celebration for that, mate. <laughs> We'll, we'll see if we can get a mug made up or something like that. And we can have a cu- a cup of tea or something, or just to, just to say fifty episodes in. But no, that's I had no idea. A mug, no I think, idea. I think your mugs bloody support exactly. Rangers sometimes. Ah, eh? I know. Tell 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 me about it, mate. Yeah. But I'm sure our band of loyal listeners out there will uh, be thinking exactly the same. So all three of them. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Just a wee bit of housekeeping uh, first, uh, because we did get pulled up about it before. Um, we do have a new website. Um, if you go to iReadyPodcast.wordpress.com and you'll see it all in its glory there. Nothing, yep. nothing special, it's just a rundown of uh, podcast by podcast, what games we cover, um, what classic match we do, our previous old features, uh, and just in, in, in tow with that. Um, it's no all bells and whistles, it's just a basic thing, just to, because the last one I made was was a wee bit too labour intensive having to update it every day and it was a, get a pain in the arse. So. I think you're, uh, you're giving yourself a bit of an injustice there, Derek. I was very impressed when I went and I'd, I'd like to say, as usual with this podcast, uh, it's had absolutely no input from me whatsoever. Uh, just like everything else this podcast, it's all down to Derek's hard work. So no, you're, you're doing yourself an injustice there, mate. I was very impressed with it when I looked at it and uh, I'll give you my bio to put on it uh, just so that you can add that in uh, just uh, our new sort of followers and that can have a wee look at that. But no, it's really, really impressive and well done, mate. Thank you. Shucks. <laughs> <And then> exactly. <laughs> we also, as ever, we have our uh, Twitter handle, which is at iReadyPod. You can contact us well at uh, via email if people even use that these days, which is iReadyPod at hotmail.com. Our Facebook account is facebook.com slash iReadyPod as well. Excellent, yes. So that's out the way, we'll do it at the end of the podcast as well. Exactly, yep, that's the best thing to do. So, uh, dare we do it, but we go down the tunnel and onto the park. So what... 
what game are you starting with, Derek? Are you starting with any of the, the, the pre-season friendlies or are you going to go straight into the horror show? Well, I'll go straight into the, what has now become the horror show. Thursday the 29th of June, it was Rangers aggress against Pro Grey Nidacon. Uh, mm-hmm. We won 1-0 and that was in the Europa League qualifier, round one, leg one. Uh, we lined up Fotheringham, Tavernier, Bates, Cardoso, Wallace, Jack, Miller, Holt, Cant- Cranchar, even, Dalcio and Wycorn. On the subs bench we had Anik, Beerman, McCrory, Rossiter, Windass, Candias and Morelos. Full of expectations this game. It was our first game back in Europe in yep. six years. It was a long awaited and the expectations were certainly yep. high. Full house Derek, complete sellout. Fans were really looking forward to it and we thought we would go out and with the, you know, the fans t- totally behind the team and the fans have been fantastic, I'd like to add. Uh, I think we all thought it was going to be a bit of a stroll in the park, really considering the opposition we were playing. Full house at Ibrox, it would be too much for them, but it turned out to be a bit of a struggle, didn't it? Yeah. Um, just at the start, there was a, another good card display from the Union Bears uh, yeah. in the Broomland stand uh, and Dave King came out at the start and gave a, a very good speech and basically as well kind of reminding the fans just to watch what you do because everybody's watching us and yes. they always get picked up mm-hmm. and we'll get into it but what do people do? Fling paper onto the park Yep, stupid yep. Derek absolutely stupid uh, just like what the the chairman had said, he didn't want us to bring any undue attention to ourselves and I know it was just pieces of paper and that Derek but it's still is seen uh, as you know the fans throwing missiles and stuff onto the pitch it was really a stupid thing to do uh, I don't know what your take on it is Derek it would be exactly the same as mine I think uh, it's just you know why do it really idiots that are doing these things and totally unnecessary yeah well we'll get into that when it actually mm-hmm. happens in the game but yep. um, basically in the first 15 minutes it was good patient play uh, some good link ups getting forward but not finding the gaps in the box good defending as well um, Cranshaw playing some great balls from midfield mm-hmm. and Dalcio was roaming about both wings uh, kind of looking quite menacing but without doing doing too much Yes, aye, that, that was the thing uh, Granchard, de- definitely the standout in the first half Derek, as you say, some of his passing was fantastic Getting into space and you know playing out to the wings Just exactly what you said there D- Delcio did look menacing you know, when he was running with the ball But not really getting anywhere if you know what I mean He was, yeah. he was going d- d- down the wing, getting d- dispossessed I think that was the sort of story of, our, of the two games But as I say, you'll get in, in, into that as well But yeah. uh, Cranchard definitely the standout for me in the first half. Yep. Um, good link up play in the 15th minute between Miller and Wallace. Gets the ball forward. Waghorn falls, uh, it was falling down. Um, lays it off to Cranchard, who hits a shot just wide of the left hand post. In the 17th minute, it was a free kick from 25 yards, floated into the box, and the keeper punches it out. 20th minute, Miller taking the ball forward, an amazing run, runs out of space, gets the ball to Dalcio, who hits a shot wide over the bar. Um, 23rd minute, fantastic build-up play, uh, trying to find the gap. Played wide right by Miller to Tavernier, who plays the ball into Nico Cranchard, who is in the six-yard box and he just head- headers it wide. Good play all the same, that anyway. Yep. 28th minute, Connor whipped in right uh, from the right, bounces in the middle of the box. Bates hits a shot from 10 yards, but over the bar. Uh, he was under pressure from the defenders, though. 31st minute, first shot uh, from Progress or pro grey as they should be called, uh, was going well wide, deflected shot, and uh, Wes Fotheringham saved it, uh, going out for the corner. And yep. on the 36th minute, we did score, and go 1-0 up. Uh, it was a goal by Kenny Miller, who else? Uh, yep. Very quick and very um, smart, free, quick free kick by um, Nico Cranshaw on the edge of the box, on the right-hand side. Passed it to Miller, who was as switched on as, as Cranshaw was. Ran onto the ball, got behind the pro-grey players, uh, hit the ball, passed the keeper into the back of the net. Fantastic uh, work, work to go. Yep, it was really, you know, very quick thinking there by both players, by Cranchart and by uh, Kenny Miller. Miller running off in a fantastic low shot into the bottom corner. Really, really, uh, you know, decisive goal for Miller. Uh, really, you know, I, I, I can't finish and just sort of uh, going from where he left off last season. Superb. And from there, 
you know, I thought we were really going to go out and score three or four after that, Derek. Yep. Um, 40th minute, this is when the paper incident happened. There was a game stoppage for two or three minutes uh, because fans were throwing paper onto the park and there was too much of it there and the referee decided to call call a, a stoppage to the game to get mm-hmm. it cleared. I mean, fans were throwing stuff at the at the keeper every time he came out to, to uh, take a goal kick and this it just got too much and the referee blew for the, blew the whistle for the stoppage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Kenny Miller even came over uh, to try and help clear and fans were still throwing stuff down. And yeah. Quite rightly so, a lot of the stadium booed the, the fans that were still doing it. This has led us to uh, be issued with a €6,000, sorry, it was a €7,000 uh, fine by UEFA. It's just, as you said, it's exactly what uh, Dave King was, was saying. Don't bring attention to yourself in a negative yeah. light and that's all these idiots were doing. Yeah. Yes, it's only paper, it's not the biggest crime in the world, but at the end of the day, it's caused Rangers to be seen in a negative light. And yes. If these fans don't understand that, that we need to be whiter than white because it's always us to get picked up on, then I, th- there's nothing that's going to stop it. Because exactly. at the end of the day, we can't hold you know, ourselves to a higher standard. If we can't hold ourselves to that kind of standard, then we've no right to criticise any other team for, correct, for yeah. any of their misdemeanours. So. Exactly. No, just really stupid, Derek. Immature. And you've really got to to wonder, you know, what on earth are you, are you trying to do? You know, what what, what was the, the whole reason for doing it? You know, it's just absolutely stupid. But there yep. you go. 42nd minute, uh, Cranchard uh, with a shot from 20 yards on the deck down the middle, saved by the keeper. It was a good effort. Uh, yep. And just before half time, superb corner from the right by Cranchard, found the da- diving head of Cardoso on the edge of the six yard box on the left, heading into the bottom corner, but great yeah. save from the keeper. It two was, de- yeah. Two defenders were on the post, so they might have got it anyway, but it was a good good yeah. effort anyway. I, I thought I kind of cheered because I thought it was heading for the back of the net, but as you say, it was a, a, a great save. Uh, and again, I'll say it again, at that point we were well on top, having a lot of chances and we really just we, we really just did think it was going to be the next goal. It's going to be the goal that's going to, you know, finish it all for them and, you know, start us, you know, the ball rolling for us. But uh, I'll let you get in the second half. Uh, I mean, even before the game kicked off, I mean, there was fans behind me. I was obviously at the game and there was fans behind me saying, right, we need to win this by five goal, five nil. And it's like, well, the expectations are so high right now. You can never say that. Yeah, we should be beating this team quite convincingly. But at the same time, they were an unknown quantity. We were a brand new team going into this as well. So, you know, this the expectation, I thought, was just way off, off the level. But we should have been doing better, absolutely. Um, into the second half, 47th minute. Great play from Wallace to Holt down the left. Into Miller in the centre and a shot just wide of the right-hand post. 53rd minute, it was a 30-yard shot from Prograde, which was uh, way over the bar. 55th minute, it's a good save from Fotheringham. Ball played forward. Bates allowed the, the ball to bounce, which allowed the Prograde player to attack, uh, to take the shot and force the, the save for the corner. 58th minute, Candias uh, came on for Holt. Candias. Candias. <laughs> I take it you're just going to call him that for now on. What's his name like? Candias, I would say, rather than candy ass. Candy ass. <laughs> well, you, you, you just like saying that, that's what it is. Well, until, you know, he can prove himself he is a candy ass <laughs> right now, so. <laughs> Um, he came on for Holt in the 58th minute on the 62nd minute uh, Cranchard with a long range free kick into the box keeper keeper comes out and punches it away it was a good chance Uh, 67th minute Rossiter came on for Cranchard which we got a great (coughs) reception for Um, on the 71st minute Candia shot after some good direct play by him uh, saved by the knees of the keeper and the 75th minute Morelos on for Waghorn I was doing the review of this game um, after I watched the second leg, so I really got kind of pissed off and turned it off with 10 minutes to go, so I can't remember what happened in the last 10 minutes, but certainly nothing really noteworthy. No. Um, You know, as we all kind of came out of the game thinking, well, you know, it was a 1-0 win, it's not 100% great, is it? It's, you know, we we could have been doing at least a two-goal cushion. Yes. um, But... You know, I was fairly content at that point. We came away with the win. We stopped them getting their way goal. Brand new team, first game back. You know, it's the first you know ninety minutes they've played together um, as a unit. So you know, I'll take that just now. Little did we know. Yeah, little did we know, Derek, because I was sort of half expecting 
a one-one draw. That's what I thought we, we were going to get o- over there. I thought, you know, it's going to be really quite cagey, but I still expected us to score any of that team. And I know you're saying, Derek, that there's a lot of expectation, but for teams like that, we should be scoring goals against them. But it was going to be another one, one of the nights, wasn't it? It was, uh, you know, and I just I had a bad feeling after the sort of first. After the first sort of 20 minutes, I could see that there was nothing really going for us at all and we weren't doing much, but I'll let you get into the the summary of the of, of the second game anyway. Just a, just a, a quick wee point there, just Wycorn was obviously playing for most of that, that game there. Yeah. And, you know, he tries, but he's an empty shirt, I think. It's a, it's a case of he's playing up front himself, more or less. Miller's dropping back into the centre. So yep. you're, you've got a gap already there up front. You're, 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 what, what our major issue is trying to score goals, yet one of your yep. main attackers is dropping back into midfield. You yeah. know, why not take, if you're needing that extra player in midfield, why not actually take Wycorn off, put an, a, a proper attacking mid in there, allow um, Miller to stay up front, and then you've, at least you've got that proper backup rather than I've, an empty shirt up front. I've felt, Derek, when Cranchar went off... That was when we lost all of our creativity in that first leg. And it was as if Miller, Kenny Miller knew that. So he sort of put himself back in there to try and create something for us because we were doing nothing. Uh, no slagging of Jordan Rosser, but he's a defensive midfielder. He's not going to go and create loads of chances for us like what Cranchar was. And as you say... Kenny Miller was dropping back. Whether or not he was told to do that, or he was doing that off his own back, I don't know. To try and get the you know things rolling, but it just didn't work. I don't think the Cranchar's fully fit. If he had been, he would have stayed on for the whole game. But you could tell that he was toiling uh, in the second half after running the show in the first half, and that basically took the foot off the gas for us as soon as he went off. As you say, the last ten minutes of the game was you know a complete notion. You know there was nothing happening in it whatsoever. Uh, but as I say, the second game was just an absolute shambles, in my opinion. But I'll, again, I'll, I'll let you get into that. Yes, we played a couple of days early because of obviously the previous mentioned um, stadium issues. Tuesday, the 4th of July, um, it was in the Luxembourg National Stadium. Europa League qualifier, round one, leg two. Uh, dare I say it, we lost 2-0. We lined up... Uh, Foddingham, Tavernier, Cardoso, Bates, Wallace, Jack, Rossiter, Miller, Cranchar, Candias, Morellas. And on the subs bench we had Anik, McCrory, Windass, Dalcio, Wycorn, Holt and Herrera. Yep. Um, now, that lineup, Derek, uh, a lot of the new players are playing. I think we were all really quite excited to see how they were all going to play. I don't know about you, I was excited about seeing Morelos playing. I thought, here's a guy that's you know already been playing a lot of league games. He's going to be well up for it. He's going to be well fit. And I was really quite looking forward to the game to start off with. Yeah. Um, it was more or less the same as... In fact, it was... you know it was like the, the first game was a game of two halves. We played fairly decently in the first half, second half. There was no urgency in the play whatsoever. No, no. no and it was, no. It was, it was, there was no urgency in the, in the whole game, this, this game. No. No. They just they, they seem to be that they just turned up thinking they could turn up and you know they would instantly you know win the game. Um, on the first minute, anyway, we were looking forward to seeing him, but it looked as if uh, Morelos had picked up a, a wee knock, but he appeared yes. to be, appeared to be okay. Yeah. Six minute, it was a good corner in from Cranchar, good head on it, but the defender got to it. Another shot uh, by Miller on the follow up, but that was cleared away. Um, on the 15th minute, Progress had a, a free kick 25 yards f- uh, from the goal on the left-hand side. It went just by the post. On a minute later, uh, Cranchard just over the bar from 18 yards. Uh, Wallace won the ball on the left wing. Possible foul, but got the ball across to, to Cranchard to have a shot. Um, it wasn't a clean pass to him by any means. On the 20th minute, Morelos had a wee spat with a Progre player. Morelos mentioned, uh, motioned his head into the defender. Uh, defender done the same. There was no cards given. The, the defender was quite either, so the referee was quite lenient with that one. But a piece of stupidity from Morelos, to be honest, because it could have um, quite easily been a red card for him. Yeah. Yes. Um, 25th minute, uh, Cranshaw uh, with a deep corn- corner, uh, but it was a shot well wide. 32nd minute, the progress keeper had to go off with a groin injury. Um, we thought there, you know, we're going to try and test yep. the keeper now. That's when exactly. he should be pelting yes. the, pelting yep. the, the, the yep. um, keeper. 
but yep. we never had a shot on yep. target for 30 minutes. There should, have been, there should have been shots galore after that, Derek. Again, a problem uh, that just still ongoing for the whole of last season. How many times before did we say it? No shots at all. Uh, foot outside the box, incredible. And as you say, new goalkeeper on, we should have been testing him from the, the very minute that he came on. We should have been hitting high balls in there, hitting shots at him, but nothing, absolutely nothing. Yep. Uh, it was in the 36th minute, good play by Candy as to pick out um, Jack, but he couldn't get the ball to someone or he couldn't make a shot. And the ball ended up falling to Rossiter, who had a shot um, a foot wide of the post. Last 10 minutes of the half, Progre started to come back into the, the game really without doing much, but we never done anything either. No. At, at half time, uh, Dalcio came on for Morelos. Uh, yep. A minute later, it was an 18 yard shot. 18 yard shot by Progre forces a big save uh, from Fotheringham uh, yep. out for but the corner. That's when the alarm bells started to ring for me, Derek, at that point. I was sitting yep. wa- w- watching the game with my wee boy. And I says to him at half time, I say, surely we, we, we can't, be, we, we have to play better and with more urgency in the second half. But when they had that, when, when Fordringham made the save, that's when I started to think this isn't going to go our way at all. I can see this going badly. On the 48th minute, there was a great cross from Candias. Opens up a chance for Dalsu, however, it was ruled offside eh, or out of play. There wasn't any clarification on that one there. Mm-hmm. Um, 40, sorry, the 51st minute, there was a good cross in by Tavernier, but cleared out for the corner. Resultant corner headed uh, well wide and over. Um, 57th minute, I've put this good play in offside. I don't know what that meant. <laughs> okay. Um, 58th minute, there was a shot from Progress uh, just over the bar. 58th minute again, just after that, um, Windass came on for Candias, and that's when really it all started to crumble. Yeah, a bit of a, st- a, bit of a strange substitution for me, Derek. Windass c- coming on, you know, I think we know that he has got ability there, but for games like that, I think we were needing, you know, a more sort of maybe a more defensive type player at that point, just to sort of put your foot in the ball, calm things down, stop anything happening. I was I was actually quite shocked with the, the substitution that he made at that point, but uh, on you go. Yeah. We did have a couple of wee chances in the 61st, 61st minute. Uh, it was a great corner from uh, Cranchell. Jack gets his head to the ball at the, at the centre of the six-yard box, Right at the keeper, and it was an easy save. So it was a yep. good, good effort, but you know, yeah. close but no cigar type thing. Sixty yep. third um, minute, uh, Nico had a great header off the bar. It was a great cross from the left wing from Wallace. Two at the back post, falls to Nico Cranshaw, uh, and he headed it off the bar. I think that's the one where it was going up above, was it not? It was. Yeah, uh, I think so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the world came crashing down. A minute later, progress went one nil up. Um, they had a shot, it went out for the corner, the resulting corner not dealt with. How often did that happen last year? Yes, exactly. Um, cross put in, attacker got in front of Bates and he finished uh, into the back of the net. Yep. Um, 68th minute, good play from Cranshaw, taken out on the edge of the box, uh, he was taken out on the edge of the box, resulting free kick over the over, just over the bar by him. And then it was really game over on the 75th minute. Uh, Progre went 2 0 up. Free kick on the left side of the box. Uh, one bounce into the back of the net. Nobody even touched the ball from the from the no. result thing. I think it was, um, you know, Windass gave away the free kick, I think. Yeah. And he also was to deal with the, the shoddy marking as well. So, yep. um, you know, a bit of a howler from him anyway. Yes. 77th minute, Herrera came on for Rossiter. Uh, 85th minute, great cross from Tavernier. Windass headed the ball uh, in the six-yard box and he, the keeper had a slight save onto the bar. He nearly made amends, but not quite. Um, yeah. And 92nd minute, uh, Miller had a shot off the bar. So he hit the bar three times, but yeah. at the end of the day, the stats rule off the bar or off the post is not on target. So, um, absolute, absolute uh, disaster. Yep. Are you ready, Derek? Yeah. <laughs> Summed up there again by Morrissey. Uh, absolute disaster, Derek. I mean, your your uh, commentary there of the game and your covering of the game made it look as if Rangers, you know, 
you know, played quite well, uh, you know, and they, they had a lot of chances. But that setting match, Derek, to me, it just it was extremely one dimensional from Rangers, in my opinion. It seemed to be that we would get the ball. I mean, in, in the first half, we had a lot of the ball. We seemed to get the ball in midfield, pass it about, play it out to the wings, that then the winger would get tackled or n- nothing would seem to happen. And it just seemed, seemed to be like that. It seemed to be the same for the whole match. It was very much played as a, a training match, I felt, for Rangers. As you say, there was no urgency whatsoever. And it wasn't until... Uh, progress went 2 0 up, that it was as if some of the players looked at each other and thought, shit, we really need to try and score here. Yep. And then it was urgency for the last 10 minutes, but then it was too late. K- Kenny Miller was very unlucky at the end with the, the, the shot that, he had that, that hit the bar. And we did make some chances, Derek, but it wasn't. It wasn't, you know, pounding. We we should have been pounding a team, you know, a team like that. And that was what got me the most. It was just the complete lack of urgency for the players, and you can p- people can sugarcoat it all, all, all they want. It was a very, very it was a shocking result, like the, embarrassing, you know, result for us. But the performance was just more annoying. See if we'd have went out there and absolutely pummeled that team. And I mean pummeled them from start to finish. And we just couldn't score. You know, there was chances galore and we were really unlucky. But it wasn't like that. It was just, just, a, just a really, really poor showing by the team. And I think that's what's annoyed people the most. It was just so lackadaisical. It was unbelievable. Well, I've kind of held a view for a long time, and this was under under Warburton as well, that it's the players' attitudes that are, are quite clear for me that are letting this team down. Now, I'll, I'll cover this a wee bit more in depth in my next, uh, when, mm-hmm. when we get on to the news section about a player leaving, but, um, you know, a lot of people, you know, rightly or wrongly, was calling for uh, Kashina's head after that game. Now, that's never going to happen. I mean, folk who were calling that, that's their opinion, they're entitled to it. But at the end of the day, the board have just, you know, got the manager in, they've allowed to spend they've allowed them to spend ten odd million pound. There's no guarantee he's even finished yet. There's a plan in place. He's not going to get sacked. Absolutely. It was an incredibly pish fucking result. Can incredibly pish performance. It was embarrassing. It was quite clearly one of the worst we've ever had. But at the same time, you're not going to get rid of the manager after that, are you? Is I would say, yeah, if that had happened, and he's you know towards the end of the season, and it was a result of a similar nature, absolutely, yep. and, and performances were still that bad. But I'm, you know, it's it's his first you know proper game with his team in charge. I am going to try and play devil's advocate here, Derek. I really, I'm not sure about the guy at all. I really am. I'm not going to be stupid and say oh he should definitely be sacked but I've looked over since he's taken charge and I know you keep hearing this about oh it's no his own players it's no his own team but since he's taken over Derek has there been any improvement in the team do you think since he's taken over has there been you know the game at Petodre you know, was was pretty even Stephen, and then in the last you know ten minutes we scored three goals. Uh, you know, in the last ten minutes that was you know the, the, his best result so far. But going by, there has been no consistency since he's came in. We've had a couple of all right performances. We've had some shocking performances, and then we've had a, a you know a great result against Aberdeen, and then you know some pretty poor displays, and then going in. To this, you know, the the this game and the pre-season games so far have been absolutely shocking for me. I'm just worried there doesn't seem to be any clear improvement. Or if tell me, please, if you think I'm talking shite, I'm talking and I'm I'm missing something, but I'm not seeing any improvement. And I, and I'm not going to you know say for the guy he needs to go. I said last season the guy he needs time, he needs his own team. And he's, he's getting his own team and only time will tell. But I am just worried at the moment, Derek, that there doesn't seem to be any improvement at all under him with his tactics, with his way he's, he's, he's got the team playing and stuff like that. 
do you feel the same way or do you see a definite improvement in the team since he's came in? I would agree with it to the extent that there's not been the usual spike in play like there normally is when a new manager comes in. Yep. However, if you look at the way he was playing, his team selections ever since he taken over, especially towards the end, of, we can only really judge him so far on, obviously, the games he came in at the end of last season and the the progress games, absolutely. Because, the, the, see, the pre-season friendlies, people are doing their dinger in about pre-season friendly results. That's just fucking nonsense, that. But if you look at the way he was setting up his teams, he was changing players, he was playing diff- people in different positions, it's almost as if, internally he's kind of said to the team right we're writing off the last season we're going to do a bit of experimentation we're going to play in this position just to see who's who I want to keep at the end of the day and if you don't play we're getting rid of you which is obviously what he's done so has last year has he taken the view for the end of last year as right this is an experiment stage we're not going to get well we'll try and get second but the chances are we're not going to get it as long as we get third and Europe that's that's quite happy we'll do a wee bit experiment <laughs> right okay that's the way I, I think that the, the way it's maybe went down but again we're not privy to the conversations yep. you know it's it's one of these things as well and I was talking about player attitudes you've still got a majority of the players that were signed under Warburton there and as I said I think there's a big attitude thing and with the likes of Windass coming on in that progress game and his first thing was oh I'm going to sort my hair you know fuck mm-hmm. that but Derek that me and you sitting uh, looking at the game the way it was panning out were drawn one, uh, sorry, we're, we're drawing 0-0 against this team. It's enough to, to get us through. We're not playing well. We need somebody to come in to sit in the midfield and basically stop them coming forward. Somebody put, to put their foot in the, the you know the ball and calm everything down. Windass isn't the man to do that. And that's when the questions come in with the manager. What what was he trying to get out of Windass to come on? Was he looking for us to score a goal? Was he, you know, tr- trying to get us to go forward? It's, it was it's strange decisions like that. And again, going back to my um, initial question, which you've no, which you've no answered. You've been like a politician there, Derek, and sort of sideswerved it. Do you think there is any any uh, progression since he's came in? Do you think we're, we're any better than we were when he, you know, b- b- before he came in? Short of giving you a yes or no answer, I had to answer the question, but no, I would have said. No. But as and I said, I, but then it's, it's not it's not as simple as a yes and no question, because if he's done what I have what I think he's done, then in terms of use the la- end of last season as a as a test to see who he wants to, to get, then quite rightly there's not going to be a, a, a vast improvement. And as I said, you can't polish a turd. And well, I, I genuinely think a lot of these players are like turds, and that's what, the reason why we haven't seen any spike in improvement when the new managers came in or or as yet because yeah. see see well look at Sorry. look at the starting lineup of of that second leg. There was seven players granted, yes, Miller played well last year, Fotheringham played well last year. Rossiter and Cranchar were both signed by um Warburton but yeah, they were out injured. Well, Ryan Jack was playing in midfield and I've I have i have not been impressed with him so far in the two, the the two games that I've I've watched oh, him, I, I think don't he's. Know. I think I think he played well in the first game. He was he was I very he controlled that midfield, and that I was the problem. Know, Derek, that was the problem with the with the first game. Yeah, the second second half was pretty poor and pedestrian, but they, we still controlled the game and never looked like losing. Had we had maybe pushed out a wee bit and maybe score tried to score, we might we wouldn't be talking about this now. But you look at that. Going back to my point about this second leg. You had Fodringham, Tavernier, Cardoso, Bates, Wallace, Jack, Rossiter, Miller, Cranshaw, Candias and Morelos. There was four players of of the, the eight, nine players that he's brought in that were only his players. The rest of them were either signed under Warburton or played under Warburton. What does that tell you to me? That That's that's what the one thing I said to, to my mates after the game. We had seven of the, the 11 players um, worked under Warburton. Do that's, you th- that's not a new team. Right. Here's here's another question for you then. When Graham Murray was put in charge of those same players, I feel personally 
that those players who had not been performing all season did raise their game when Murray was put in charge. And I don't know if it was because he concentrated more on defence of the team rather than the midfield and made us a lot more watertight at the back. But I feel that going on the short period that Murty was in charge, that we showed more progression than we have with Kishinya. And as I say, Derek, I'm no going to be calling for his head. I'm going to give him time and I'm hoping that everything works out. But I'm just I'm going by what I've seen and I feel that Graham Murray, who I didn't want, I, I, I wouldn't want him to be the manager full time, but I just feel that he got more out of the players, out of those same players than what the new manager has. But again, only time is going to tell what's going to happen there. I hope he turns it round. I'm hoping that all these players that we've signed are going to, you know, t- turn it to be fantastic buys. But at this moment in time, I am not convinced. Right. I mean, we've, it's academic talking about it now because yep. he's not going to be going. You know, he's not going to get sacked. Yep. He's not, and if he walks, then that's really up to him and, and the, the board. But I don't know. No, I don't think he's the type no. of guy that will, Derek. I think he's got the way he's talking. The way I think he has the idea in his head as to how he wants his team to play, uh, and I think he wants to see it through, which is which is great. Uh, i just, I, I just wish we could see a wee glimpse, Derek, of something, a wee glimpse of, oh, you know, I can, de- you know, we can definitely see an improvement in the team there. We can definitely see that, but so far to me, it's not happened. Uh, and I know what you're saying about pre-season friendlies and the closed doors games that we've been playing. You, you can't really t- take anything in, into that. But see, even if if we'd had one. Pre-season closed door game that we'd won three or four nothing against a half decent team. I think that would settle a lot of people down. I think they would say, "Oh, I well, he, he, you know, they've obviously played played well in that game, but so far it's not happened." Uh, and he's got two big games uh, pre-season friendlies coming up. He's got a big game on Saturday against Marseille, and regardless, again. The team will be under the spotlight big time as to how they play on Saturday, and again they're playing away at Sheffield Wednesday, which I'm sure you'll talk about as well. But again, I mean, be- but, but again, I really don't understand why people get their tits in a fucking fankel over over results and of a pre-season friendly because this- they're, they're they're looking for a wee. Glimmer of light, Derek. Something. But you don't get a glimmer of light in a, in a pre-season friendly. You don't get that. It's all about getting match fitness and you know getting a gel and, and another understanding of your team together. It's never about results. And it's, all, day, it's all to do with excitement, though. It's all to do with you know there'll be people who'll be paying good money to go and watch all the new signings, and you know everybody wants to see a good a good performance. I know, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. It means these games mean nothing. But the fans are looking for a wee glimmer of light for somewhere to say to themselves, oh, well, I'm really going to look forward to seeing him next season because seeing that that, that friendly was outstanding. Uh, I'm really looking forward to him going to play. Oh, I'm sure he's going to score a lot of goals next season or see him. He's absolutely rock solid. Yeah, but it's not going to be much of, is, is, is going to get past him. But we've not seen any of that so far. But there was a, None. a, it was a, a season a couple of years ago where we had played great in the pre-season but then absolute pish in the real, real life stuff. Because you look at, oh yeah, he played great in that game but your opposition is not going to be given 100%, are they? Because they're not wanting to get injured for the, for the up-and-coming season. So I would much rather have a shit pre-season that they get get gelled together and then they start getting better throughout the league rather than a great bloody you know um, pre-season against half-hearted opposition and then you know being being utter shit I'm in no, the league I'm, I'm not talking about like having a great pre-season though I'm just looking for you know something something to, to cling on to at the start of the season that people would say oh I you know I'm really looking forward to this season but right now all we can see for everybody is, oh God, this is going to be a nightmare. 
that's yeah, because, all, that's because all that we're is reading. because that is one the media and two that is Rangers fans' expectations. Yes, yeah, we and this is where it's like incredibly wrong from our Rangers fans, and I've I've said it before. Our expectations were for for last year were always based on that semi final. And that got blown out the water because Celtic were much better than we give them any credit for. Right on, just on the the back of obviously the the um, defeat against Nidacon, you know, we're quite rightly getting pilloried uh, from right, left, and centre. But at the same time, there was a lot of false truths out there. Um, there was pictures came out, uh, one picture, sorry, came out after the game, and it looked as if like Pedro was having a go at the fans outside the ground. However, I said to someone, you know, you, you didn't know what what's happened, you know, before that. You don't know what's mm-hmm. been said or anything. There was a picture that came out uh, you know, about five, ten minutes later, it was the other side of that exact same picture from from looking into the fans, and he was actually going out to shake a fans' hands, and everything was all quite, quite you know, nice. However, mm-hmm. the team bus was kind of rounded up uh, by our fans uh, as they were leaving, um, hammering on the bus and shouting, "It's a disgrace!" and all that kind of thing. Kind of understandably, um, Liam Kelly, uh, the substitute or the third goalkeeper, put on Snapchat, "Can you let us out the fu- the the bus without fucking hammering on it?" Um, I mean, he's a later apologised for it. Um, Dean Windass is becoming fast becoming a complete arsehole. He, he's no letting his son deal with his own battles. You know, again going on Twitter and getting into spats with fans trying to defend and defend his son. His, def- his son, you know, fucked up in the game basically. He's got to take the stick when it's coming to him. You can't let your daddy fight your own battles all the time. Um, and then Barry Ferguson, this is the biggest stupidest thing, you know, he's like Ali McCoy, well, for, as a player will always be respected, always be a legend, however as a person in the media, a complete arse he came out and stated that Pedro is a month to save his job, but the problem was, there's no competitive games in that month, so... The uh, the whole thing with Barry Ferguson is, Derek, is I think he's still raging that he's got nothing to do with Rangers at the moment, I think he, he thought himself that it was a stick on to get one of the, the, the coach's job or the assistant manager's job or whatever. Uh, he didn't get it. Uh, I think he's rather bitter about that and he's now writing for a certain newspaper, which I'm sure you'll get into <laughs> late, later on as well. Uh, and he's doing himself no, no favours, Ferguson, to be fair to him. You know, a guy who is, is an absolute legend for the club, a phenomenal player, a great captain, he's doing himself no favours and there's there's some, t- some of the stuff that he puts in there is, is quite baffling. You know, it seems to be that he, he doesn't do any sort of support of the club at all when he's writing for that newspaper, which doesn't surprise me in the slightest. But... As you say, it's uh, some of the stuff he's been writing has been put pretty shocking and pretty stupid, as you say, for him to say he's got a month to go and there's no any actual competitive <laughs> games is quite laughable. But um, And Jordan Rossiter came out after the game and done an interview um, profusely apologising. He spoke extremely well and he acted like the, the, the captain of the team. Yes. About question. Sh- yeah. Question: where, where was the captain at that point? Exactly. Um, I mean, as all that's been said, we've kind of discussed it. Other podcasters discussed it. Um, I'm sorry, but Lee Wallace is not the captain on the pitch. I don't know what happens, you know, behind the scenes, Derek. If he's, you know, he's great with other the players and stuff like that. You know, was, we we all we all love the guy because he did stick with us through thick and thin. He, he could quite easily have moved on, but. I think it's coming quite glaring that uh, certainly on the pitch he doesn't seem to be the leader on the pitch uh, and the fact that the youngest player in the team came out and spoke to the media and as you say he was he was actually I was really pleased with, with some of the stuff he said he was totally embarrassed totally uh, apologetic for the way the team had played and he genuinely looked gutted the guy and looked quite shocked as well so I it's uh, there's a lot of talk about Alves coming in, uh, what's going to happen there. Maybe it would be the making of Lee Wallace, Derek, for him to no longer be the captain. It would maybe sort of, you know, take a bit of responsibility off him and let him just concentrate on the playing side of things because we need him to be his best now on the park. Uh, so I don't know if that's the answer or not, but it's certainly going by what we've seen. He's no looking as if he's the, the, the leader that we're wanting him to be. No, I mean... The problem now comes is who do you want to be captain because, uh, you know, a lot of people have been calling for Alves to be captain yep. because he's previous experience that. But the guy's what thirty six, he's on a two year deal. It's not a long term thing. You know, Rossiter mm-hmm. spoke like a captain, but you know, can he stay fit? 
you know, Kenny Miller, he's a vice captain, he's a stick, he should be a stick on, but he's yeah. he's only got another year to go and I doubt he's going to get another contract out of this. Um, you know, Ryan Jack is maybe the most obvious one, he plays in the centre of the park and, you know, obviously previous uh, successful Aberdeen captain. However, you know, given the fact that we've got a lot of midfielders, you know, in the centre of midfield anyway, you yeah. know, is he the one that's going to be playing week in, week yep. out? You, mm-hmm. We don't know, so it's a... It's a hit and miss there. Um, yeah. I mean, I thought um, the boy Hodgson came in and pl- done a good job when Wallace yep. was out. You know, so is it going to be even a case where Wallace is going to keep his position? You've uh, and you've missed out as well a player that we've signed since then as oh, well, yeah. and Graham Dorrance, who I think, apart from Alves, is uh, you know he's a in my opinion, that's the type of guy that you'd want extremely experienced. You know, Rangers daft uh, coming into the team. I'll be shocked if the guy doesn't make a huge improvement to us. Uh, that's the guy that I would be looking for for captain, if if not Alves. But as you say, good point. Alves is only there on a two year contract, and after that, you don't know. But uh, do you, would you, if it was up to you, would you take the captain say off, Wallace? I mean, based on what we've seen over the last couple of years, yeah. yeah. Because yep. he certainly does. It's not just for the fact that we're not playing well. It's the fact that you, you look at his body language when he when he is playing, and when somebody makes a mistake or in like, he's not like your Barry Ferguson or Richard Goff where they get on top of them and yeah. they, they try and give them either one a bollocking or two words of encouragement. You just don't see that with him. And yeah. and I've always thought somebody you know it should be the the centre mid or centre defence that is the captain because any other position you're not effectively communicating to the rest of the players. How yeah. like, remember when Kloss was was um, captain? How could he effectively communicate to an attacker? He couldn't, you know. So it's it has to be in that centre back or centre mid position for me. Yeah. Well, only time will tell on that one, Derek. What what, what actually happens? But I, certainly, Dorans would get my yeah. my vote just now. But uh, we've not even spoke about him yet, Derek. So no, that was you, you. always wreck my bloody playlist I've got going here. <laughs> Because as you already said, we do have up and coming games. Sunday the 30th of July, um, Sheffield Wednesday uh, at, at Hillsborough again. Yep. Certainly we've taken, we've got our full allocation already sold out and we're looking to yep. try and get more. Um, so certainly they're, they're more than welcoming uh, mm. for us again. And the one on this Saturday coming up, it's uh, at home to Marseille. Um, yeah. I'm not going to the game because I never signed up for the friendlies. To be honest, and I know people, there's twos and fours for it. £15 for the friendly, I thought was a wee bit much. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, that's, if people want to pay that, that's fine. I saw, I've seen somebody on, on Twitter, you know, can you know absolutely slamming people for having a go at the ticket prices. Well, you know, it's not just about that. You know, we, we pay our season tickets, we go to other games, we pay for other things like Rangers Lotto, you know, RTV and things. We can't go afford to go to every single game. And I thought £15 was a wee bit too much for the friendly, but yeah. that was just me. Okay. Just in terms of uh, pre-season games so far, um, we've had a couple other um, pre-season friendlies. Monday the 10th of July, it was a 2-1 win against Kilmarnock, uh, closed doors at Auchinhowie. Um I've not watched the games, um, but certainly this one, uh, it was Doran's uh, playing his first game, and he apparently ran the show from what I was hearing, but um, won 2-1 anyway. And Tuesday the 1st of July, um, it was another closed doors game at Auchinhowie. It was a 1-0 loss uh, to St. Johnson. Uh, reports say we played, played pretty well but it was the usual story of nothing up front yep. uh, it seems to be a feature of the last two years um, goal conceded was was very poor it was really straight out of the warbit and playbook with Alnick uh, fanning about with the ball at the back tried to pass it out um, the defender had never had the greatest of touches uh, but he was put under pressure anyway by a shit uh, outfield pass by the keeper um, the St Johnson player got it and lobbed it over the keeper so um, and the player and the player that scored the winner for them, it was Colin, was. Colin Hendry's son. Yes, it was that. Yep. Um, and Nico Cranchar as well he got to- ordered off the pitch for shouting at the ref after a bad challenge went in again- against them however no red card was shown so I don't know what it was all about to be honest um, but we'll let that one go anyway yeah um, on the run up as well uh, going into the actual season we did cover it um, last with a podcast however a couple of changes I think uh, we've got the first game of the season moved to Sunday the 6th of August that's away to Motherwell at half one I believe that's on TV ok 
And Saturday the 12th of August at home to Hibs, 3 o'clock yep. kick-off. So that is a game that I will be attending. Yep. That will be my first game of the oh, season. I'm, uh, I'm going to be getting tickets for me and my boy and possibly my brother as well because I was talking to him about it. But we'll, I'm definitely off on that Saturday. So the tickets for that, I was looking today, go on sale on the 24th of this month. So as soon as they go on sale, I will be going to that game. So I think that will be a cracker against Hibs at Ibrox. I think the atmosphere will be fantastic. Yep, and then we play at home to the other half of uh, Edinburgh the next yep. weekend, Saturday the 19th of August at home to Hearts. And then rounding out the month, Sunday the 27th of August away to Ross County. Yep. Now those four games, Derek. Uh, I think the manager he's got a lot of pressure on him just now. But on paper, the, the certainly the two away games for us, c- considering we never bloody beat Ross County last season, did we? Uh, I think uh, we on paper those are certainly four winnable matches for us. But the team really need to get a good start away at Motherwell first and then build for there but they're certainly on paper they're winnable matches I just hope that they can actually do it um, I just think there's, as I said to you before already there's too much pressure on them and it's coming not from outside sources it's coming from our own fans and you could argue yeah that's right we, we need to kind of start winning but you look at you know other results like you, you, you take you know the first game against Motherwell as our you know his game one because that's what you need to do effectively. Mm-hmm. Then you know you look at the Advocaz first year. You know he started off pretty pretty ropey. We ended up winning the treble. You know so it's, I'm not going to Although, say that's going to happen. But you need to judge these things at the end of the season. You know you can't I, you can't say I, after four games. I, I was at the Advocates' first game. It was at Tynecastle, Derek, away from home, and we got beat. But we played really well in the game, and we should never have got beat. And that, for me, I said to myself, oh, well, that'll not happen because we should have won that game. If it happens like that and Rangers play really, really well, but we get beat, I can accept that. You know what I mean? But as I say, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Yeah. Right, we'll move on now, and we will go into the Blue Room. Right, a few things to talk about here. Um, Obviously, the big one is the Supreme Court tax case uh, ruled that EBTs were perfectly legal, however, should have been taxed. Um, Really, the usual. So, effectively, it meant the BDO has lost the Supreme case. Um, All it really means is that, I mean, we don't want to really rehash something that has already been done to death. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Um, But really, all all that really means was the fact that we should have paid tax on the EBTs. No Mm -hmm. no more, no less. Um, It's got the usual suspects foaming at the gash over this. Yeah. Um, You know, Celtic have instantly issued a statement saying they wanted, effectively, without saying as much, they want the data stripped. Aye, it was a stupid statement to make, Derek. I kind of saw it as a... Uh, oh, I, we've seen the ruling. There's not really much that we can do about it, but to appease our fans, were basically saying that we want something done about it, but no really saying what it was that they were wanting to do. I thought it was got a really baffling statement by them, uh, and they were going to be seeking legal advice on it as well. Uh, but again, if they hadn't have said anything there, the hordes of their supporters would, would have been going absolutely daft about it. So I thought it was a strange, strange statement that they put out, but I'll, I'll let you go on with what you thought about it. Yeah. Um, much the same as you, I was just baffling, and why did they have to even make a statement? It, it was nothing really, you know, to mm-hmm. do with them yeah. effectively. Uh-huh. Um, Aberdeen fans, you know, they, oh. you know, are just complete idiots. You know, really, um, they were raging for some weird reason because yep. I don't think any of the titles that were involved had anything to do with them in the first place. <laughs> um, they've got a bit of a cheek as well because they were saved uh, twice from relegation by yeah. the stupid ten thousand seater rule. Yep. So they've got a cheek to talk about sport and integrity. Um, SFA, you know, give them their credit. They instantly as well came out with a statement saying that they've sought legal advice. They've been told that a case um, 
would be highly likely to be unsuccessful and in any case any punishments they could could issue out would not justify taking it any further anyway. The SPFL apparently are still looking into it. Now, as that's been kind of highlighted by uh, Heart and Had podcast, it's not a case that um, SFA are not doing anything about it. It's a case of they've already checked if they can do something about it or not and they've been told legally they've got nowhere to stand. So yep. if they, they were, if they wanted to do something and they could have, they would have done it already. So, but, you know, it's not going to go any further than that and no matter what anybody else says, it's not going to go any further. What I want to know as well, though, is they've, they've kind of, the way they've went about it, all these people who hate us and want our title stripped, they keep going on about they want the title stripped, they want any trophy we want stripped. Well, why not? why not base their campaign of hate on we want every result voided that they used players who had ABTs because that would be the actual fair thing to do if there was any more punishments to be to read out not just stripping the titles so effectively every result should be wiped out from us then not just the titles so even their argument in the first place is nonsensical because they're yeah. not going after what would be the fair thing to do yeah exactly so, aye it's, uh, it's it's bizarre and uh I mean, there was even uh, there was even talk for uh, no a lot of them, Derek. But there was even talk from Kilmarnock fans saying that they, you know, they were cheated out of uh, European money. And I think <laughs> the whole time, I think they only qualified for Europe twice or something <laughs> like that when it was there. So it's you know it's it's incredible. I know that there is a, a very low percent of mad fans out there who are obsessed with our club and they'll, they'll keep it going and we'll keep being called all the cheats on you know on, on, under the sun Derek but it's now getting quite tiresome and I'm I'm really not that bothered about them anymore. It was it was it was bad that you know in the first sort of week but it's still going and it's just it's laughable and really childish for you know quite a lot of them out there and they don't want to actually accept the truth as to what actually happened. They basically just see I you cheated, we want your titles end of, and uh, the, the SFA have gone over it, but there's nobody willing to, you know, to say that, you know, and, and look at it, you know, rationally, which is incredible. Uh, the thing that's been getting me, though, is the media response to it as well has been quite incredible also, Derek, but again, by the usual suspects out there, and I'm sure you're going to say a wee bit about a certain... Uh, section of the media that uh, Club eighteen seventy two have been talking yeah, about. I'll get into that in a minute, but I mean, yep. I mean, there's nobody calling for Lionel Messi to be stripped of any of his accolades after he's been found guilty of tax fraud. By the way, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it had a twenty one month uh, jail sentence attached to it. However, mm -hmm. they've basically forgone that, and he has to pay less than two hundred and fifty thousand pounds on a <laughs> on a tax fraud of three point yeah. six million yeah. pounds. You know, nobody's yep, calling incredible. for him to be to be stripped of anything. So, just goes to show you that's an illegal thing he done, and he's been found guilty of. Yep. yet nothing. So incredible. I know. Um, Dave King issued a very strong statement in his capacity as a previous board member, not as a, a chairman. Mm -hmm. Really firmly put Celtic and the media right in their place and put the, the um, blame firmly on David Murray. Um, it was a very levelled and dignified yet hard hitting statement. Just on the fact of David Murray, um, you know, he's he's fucked us twice over. He really has, hasn't he? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's uh, w we had a fair idea after the, the revelations that came out from the BBC's uh, we documentary that, that they did uh, in the interview with Alistair Johnson, but it really does look as if he has done a number on us big time, Derek. It's more the case that when you're using these things, surely, I mean, yes, I, f I fully accept he's probably taken some sort of financial advice. They've told him this, that and the other. But surely, you know, he knew this. And that was the whole reason for him selling up was the big tax case because he could have been levelled yeah. with, the, with the debt. Mm -hmm. um, the, the irony in the whole situation, though, is had it not been for um, the actions of Craig White and Charles Green, we would be looking at liquidation now as in the company. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Craig White, he kind of came out after the result and he kind of, I hate to say, but correctly says you were looking at liquid, Rangers were looking at liquidation either any way you looked at it, weren't you? Right, okay. Um, I'm, I'm still trying to, uh, to, 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 to get my head around the, 
you know the progress the whole, is up. <laughs> <laughs> I it's uh, the, the the whole thing has been a mess, and uh, you know it now looks as if it's been. I don't want to use the word masterminded, Derek, but uh, I can't really think of anything else from David Murray. You know, right from the beginning, as you say, he's he, he's bailed out. He's he's managed to save his company at the expense of us, and you know we've had to suffer that for the last you know six years. It's been quite incredible, and it's taken that long for you know us to get any type of information like that to come out. It's yeah. incredible. Really is. Yep. On your point about Club 1872, they issued a very strong statement saying that they'll go after anyone who tries to take our titles um, and also said they will make sure they uncover um, and go after anyone with any irregularities in the last 50 years. Um, I think that was uh, firmly directed at one club in particular. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, and they also released a statement slamming the campaign by the Daily Record and three of its senior staff members that they've got against Rangers. They're all non-Rangers fans. They're all Aberdeen, Celtic, and Dundee United fans. The three clubs who are um, wanting to boycott, you know, are wanting us our title stripped. <laughs> um, and we are, uh, you know, they've called for all Rangers fans to boycott the Daily Record. Quite rightly so. I mean, I've taken the daily record off our, off our Twitter. Yeah. Don't mm-hmm. go to their yeah. sites anymore. So. No, I'm the same. Exactly. exactly. Well, Derek, to be fair, I've been like that for quite some time. I've, I've had a, a hatred to that newspaper for quite a few years now. Uh, I've told you before, my, my mother, uh, for years and years and years, uh, bought the daily record on a daily basis. Uh, and it's you know when you get to a, a, a certain age like what my mother is uh, she's a creature of habit and she was still going out and buying the newspaper up until recently till I basically told her look just didn't do it go and buy a completely different newspaper as well because I was getting annoyed that even she was buying it uh, some of the stuff in it is incredible it is totally their, their agenda is totally against us I don't care what anybody says I've been saying it for a long time they are completely toxic toxic when it comes to our club and they will try anything that they can to put a negative story in about us or about our supporters whenever they can Yep, they certainly will Last piece of boardroom news here is Stuart Robertson is making a bid to get back on the SPFL board again Uh, This is apparently the third time he's done it, the last time he was in the running and he pulled out for unknown reasons Mm -hmm. Um, An interesting thing here is Peter Lywell is not running for re-election so Yeah, that's correct, now um, the cynic in me tells me that that possibly, and I hope I'm wrong, but possibly has something to do with... A conflict the, of interest. Exactly, yeah. So it's, you know, here's hoping that uh, we do have a representative on there. It's long overdue. Uh, and again, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. But hopefully that, if uh, Stuart Robertson de- de- does get in, then it's going to be, you know, the better for us and give us a better voice as well, so we'll just have to wait and see on that one. I mean, I don't understand the whole SPFL board thing. I mean, for me, it should be um, every year, re-elections, and it's the, each club put up their own representative, and the, the, the board is consistent of 12 members of the 12 you know clubs in the, the Premier yeah. Division, so... I don't know how it works, but you know certainly you know for for Rangers to be outcast for all this time for the main league. I mean, regardless of what any other club says, Scottish football is Rangers and Celtic. You know, it has been for you know a number of years. It will yeah. be forevermore. So it's you know uh, a bit baffling the way the, the Scottish yeah. football structured, but that's the way they do it. So yeah, right. Uh, we will move on now, and we will go to the classic match. Manchester, brace yourself. Rangers are coming! Right, Dave, what have you got for us this week? I have gone back in time to the year 2000, Derek. Let's all meet up in the year 2000. The CAD for Cat was in charge. The date was the 5th of August. 2000 and it was an away trip to Kilmarnock now I chose this game Derek uh, I chose it because we started off very poorly in the match and basically came back uh, played well and ended up winning the game in the end now Rangers on that day their starting uh, 11 was Stefan Kloss and goals a back four of Sergio Perini Lorenzo Amoruso Bert Conterman and Fernando Rickson 
uh, into midfield, Van Bronckhurst, Ferguson, Reyna and Neil McCann. And up front, Wallace and Billy Dodds. Now, it was a uh, new signing. Uh, it was Bert Conterman, I believe it was his first season at uh, playing in the centre of the defence. And I think this was what sort of uh, got Dick Advocate to move him forward to play in that sort of defensive midfield role because when he was in defence to start off with, he was very, very shaky, Derek, and this game sort of shows it. Now, right at the start of the match, uh, there was no really any, any clear-cut chances, uh, a lot of uh, interplay by Rangers, Kilmarnock as well, but then fourth and fifth minute. Well, that's a penalty kick. Question: Conterman really taken on in the outside by Andy McLaren, the man we mentioned right at the start. Penalty kick, no complaints, as he keeps the right leg trailing. Kilmarnock's a key player at that point was Andy McLaren. I don't know if you remember him or not, Derek. A very good player. I think he could have gone on to do a lot more, but he had a lot of bad injuries in his career. But and Andy McLaren. Uh, sort of ran through towards Bert Conterman, skipped past him and Big Bert with his long legs, a really sort of uh, lazy, sort of dodgy tackle on him, very clumsy, brings him down, the referee points straight to the spot. It was a clear penalty by, by Conterman. I don't know what he was thinking because McLaren was on the outside of the box. He wasn't going to you know, be able to cut inside or anything. So a really sort of clumsy tackle there by Conterman and McLaren stepped up himself and buried that to make it 1-0 to Kilmarnock. I talked about rehabilitation, this will take him a stride forward, yes! Curry a one-up! Three and a half minutes gone and they deserved it! Rangers all over the place at that point, didn't look as if they were doing anything, really struggling. Again, straight in the attack again, uh, Kilmarnock, they sort of targeted Conterman is being the sort of man to put pressure and they put a, I know, a great cross in and Conterman sort of jumped up and the ball gone off the back of his head and just went past our post, just past Kloss. We all thought at that point it was good. it was an own goal. Uh, we weren't playing well at all. And then Kilmarnock got the corner and I ended up with shot just wide. They were all over the place. And then on the 10th minute, it got worse for us. Trying again. Great run forward by the lad, and it's him again, his second goal, quite astonishingly the Rangers defence ripped apart right down the middle, but what an astute run by Andy McLaren. It was a long ball played by Kilmarnock into Andy McLaren again, and he basically just picked up the ball, ran straight forward and hit a low shot under Stefan Kloss, and it bounced up into the goal to make it 2-0 to Kilmarnock, so... All, all over the place, Derek, not playing well at all. And again, it was like that for the next sort of 20 minutes. Kilmarnock had all the ball, they had all the possession. Rangers really weren't doing anything at all. And then we had a very rare attack and Rod Wallace was brought down in the edge of the box. The free kick. Now, George Alberts wasn't playing that game, so it was up to Big Ammo, but uh, his shot blasted against the wall. Nothing at all. Uh, and then the 31st minute, we had a cross into the box by Giovanni Van Bronckhurst and Rod Wallace with a header. Now, that that had been our best chance. Had a header just over the bar. That, that was the best chance for us of the game, and that was in the 31st minute. Now, this was the turning point in the game after this, because Kilmarnock actually got a, a man sent off. With that well to Ferguson, Van Bronckhurst on towards Wallace. And I think he's already been booked. Is a bookable offence. Uh, nobody wants to see a, a player set off in any game, but look at that. That is a yellow card, and uh, really, I think he's very fortunate to stay on. It would have been a terrible blow to Kilmarnock, but I think the referee has been very charitable. Or is he changing his mind? Yes, he is off. If it was a second yellow card that was picked up by their defender, it was a clear foul as well. It was a stupid tackle by him. And Kilmarnock were reduced to 10 men at that point. And that really was the turning point because uh, Neil McCann 
just before half time, he had been the sort of our best player. He was causing all the problems. So just a minute before half time. McCann, lovely little turn, he goes on the outside. And it's a penalty kick. Subert tried to take him on the outside. And the referee, Tom Brown, points to the penalty spot. Neil McCann gets the ball, the right hand side of the box, a fantastic turn. Skips past his man, the defender slides in, takes McCann out, not the ball, clear penalty. Rangers had a lifeline. So Billy Dodds, there it goes, Rangers have pulled themselves back. Billy Dodds stepped up, fires in to make it 2 1 to Kilmarnock at half time. So the, the, the lifeline was there just before half time. Now, again, as I said, we weren't playing that great at all. We weren't using our full backs well in that match. So there was a substitution at half time, and uh, Andre Kinchelskis was brought on for Fernando Rickson at that point. The start of the second half, Rangers came out all guns blazing. Neil McCann was playing well. Runs past, skips past two players on the left wing, puts the cross in, great save by the goalkeeper. Pressure was piling on, Barry Ferguson had a shot for the edge of the box, which Gordon Marshall and goals for Kilmarnock managed to save as well. Then there was a double substitution after that, really going for it. Kenny Miller, a very young Kenny Miller who'd just been signed, came on and along with two guy, they came on for Sergio Perini and Rod Wallace. And say, uh, 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 strange, uh, no strange, sorry, but a uh, uh, substitution for Kilmarnock at that point, and it was of Super Ali McCoy that came on at that point. Derek uh, playing for Kilmarnock, and it just showed you because the first, the, this first touch that McCoy gets, he takes it past Bert Conterman in one side, and then skips past Lorenzo Amoruso on the other side and has a shot for the edge of the box. The ball just goes wide. So, you know, Super Ali was out to try and score against us at that point. But it was too late. Uh, Giovanni Van Bronckhurst then had a fantastic uh, play on the left-hand side. Lorenzo Amoruso comes bombing up on the left-hand side, plays a 1-2 to Giovanni Van Bronckhurst. Hits a fantastic save, uh, a fantastic shot, sorry, saved by the goalkeeper out for a corner and on the 75th minute from that very corner swept in better and it's in for Billy Dodds again would you believe well I cannot stress enough what this man has done despite all the talk about getting illustrious strikers to Ibrox it's a rescue act again by this man it gets played in Billy Dodds with a header, bang, makes it 2-2. Two -two. A fantastic goal for Rangers to get them back in. Billy Dodds, the main man at that point. Really good poacher's instinct there from him and a powerful header. Not the biggest of guys, Billy Dodds, but he made that ball his and he made Kilmarnock pay. So in the 75th minute, that was 2-2 two -two, and there really was only going to be one winner at that point because two minutes later... Al Ferguson... I want to go himself, he does. Tries to get in there. Miller's done it! The young sub puts Rangers ahead. His first real meaningful goal for the club. And Rangers now lead by three goals to two, and no wonder they're hugging him. Some great pass and play from Rangers. Barry Ferguson gets the ball in the edge of the box. He turned one guy. He twists another guy, and then he runs through on goals, hits a shot, which we all thought he'd scored. Gordon Marshall, to be fair, gets a hand to it, but he can only rebound it out to Kenny Miller, who fires the ball into the net to make it 3-2 to Rangers. Great substitution by Advocate at that point. Kenny Miller coming on hungry, desperate to get a goal, and he got it. Then, uh, right at the end of the match again, it was 4-2 for Rangers. They scored the fourth goal. Surging forward again. This time McCann with it. It's not offside and it should be. It is. Two guy does it. An intelligent run forward and that puts it beyond any doubt. The Tuckies player scored his first league goal. Neil McCann gets the ball, two guy was behind him, two guy runs through and McCann plays a fantastic chip ball right through into the middle. Two guy runs through, 
controls his ball, sidesteps the goalkeeper, takes another touch and fires it into the net to make it 4-2 to Rangers. That was two guys' first goal for the club as well, so superb goal for Rangers. So in the second half, it was a fantastic performance, a dreadful, a dreadful performance in the first half by Rangers. They were all over the place, but to be fair to the manager, he made the substitutions they were the correct substitutions and Rangers went on and actually won quite comfortable in the end. Don't know if you can remember it or no, Derek, it was. It was a fantastic setting half to sit and watch and uh, a couple of really good goals in there as well. It's one of the games I actually vaguely remember watching. To uh-huh. the last. I remember yep. the McCoy's coming on and his chance. Yeah. Yep. Um, Neil McCann was brilliant in the game yep. um, and Bert Conterman, well, he was just Bert Conterman without a blasting shot, wasn't he? So. Well, again, again I think... Uh, Conterman turned out to be a no bad player for Rangers when Advocate saw sense and moved him into that sort of defensive midfielder role. I think he'd done a hell of a lot more for us than he did when he was in defence and uh, you know popped up with a few good goals for us in the end as well. So I'll no slag Big Bear. Don't think any, anybody really does slag him after he scored that winner against Celtic, but uh, no, he was uh, rather dodgy uh, in his early career for Rangers playing in defence, but Thankfully, they, in that match, they managed to turn it round. And again, I, I go back to it. It's just it was the perfect timing for the substitutes for Dick Advocat. And what we would do to have players on the bench like two guy and a young, uh, extremely fast Kenny Miller just now, uh, Derek. But because uh, two, two guy was just an absolute class act for us, and just unfortunate that we had a brilliant midfield or you know could have played a hell of a lot more games for us at the time. Yep. So we'll uh, move on now and we'll go into the news. From ITN, the ITV News at 10 with Trevor MacDonald. Right, a few bits and pieces to cover in the news here. Uh, Plans have been submitted for... A new venue at Edmonston House. Oh, right. This is um, London King of Clubs Piers Adam. Oh, right. I did read about this, right? Okay. Yes, this is the best man at Guy Ritchie's wedding. He's been involved in various kind of clubs down in London, um, and it's plans for uh, um, to host weddings as a club, um, as a pub, as stuff and stuff, and a general venue. So um, it's he's involved in the Copper Dog. Um, He's got a company called Copper Dog Ibrox Limited uh, who are behind the bid and he's the director at it. Um, so certainly an interesting development, that one there. Uh, yeah. It's maybe not what all the fans want because I thought we were always wanting a, a museum to go in there. Yes. But certainly yeah. if it's going to be something that's going to get the club revenue, um, it will certainly get revenue being what the, pl- the plans are anyway. So yeah. we'll see what happens there. Mm-hmm. Yes. Interesting development. Uh, as we've both alluded to, we did sign, eventually sign Graham Dorns from Norwich from report for a reportedly £1.5 million. Pounds. Yep. I think it'll be a fantastic signing, Derek. I'm really looking forward to seeing him play. We got an inkling of it because his wife, I think, more than anything else with the tweets that she was putting out, she certainly seems delighted about coming back to Scotland as well. And, you know, really pleased for him that he's getting to fulfil his boyhood dream and play for his heroes. So that's the type of player we need, Derek. Someday, you know, we're a bit of class. We spoke about him in length in the last, you know, in the, the a couple of pods ago when we're looking at the players that we were targeting. So I'm delighted that we've got him in. Yep. Uh, and I'm, as I say, I'm, I'm really looking forward to see him play. Yep. Um, next one here is we sold Barry Mackay to Knott's Forest for a paltry £500,000. Uh, bearing in mind, we did get the same for a 15 year old uh, uh, for the development fee, which. Goes to show we shouldn't be selling our, you know, potentially our best players for some stupid, you know, amounts like that. Always been the case with us, you know, we, we always overspend for players and we sell players for, for peanuts. Yes, he has, he only had a year left in his contract and he wasn't signing a new deal, um, but it was still a, a really shit fee. He's came out in social media after that, you know, just saying that uh, he was told that he was really surplus to requirements, so he really had no choice but to leave. And comments that came out today that no player should be treated the way he was treated, Kashina treat him, treated him very badly. I mean, he was on the bench and told to train harder. He wasn't in Guantanamo Bay, as somebody pointed yeah. out on Twitter. So a lot of 
people were upset, you know, I think I'm leaving, but at the same time, you've got to remember when we were making our way back up in the third division, bear in mind he was only 18, 19 at the time, he was sent out on loan for a year and a half solid. And that was after him playing fairly well for us when he first came into the team. I think for me that that says it all. You wouldn't put, you know, you're sending him out on loan for a year and a half when he could have been easily playing in the first team gaining that same experience. Yeah. So he blew hot and cold for me. He certainly has a lot of potential, but I think, as I was alluding to earlier, that's if that's the type of attitude the players have got at being told to sit on the bench or told to come in early to train harder, then that's the attitude problem I'm talking about. We have yeah. at Ibrox now, not yep. the manager, the attitude problem of the previous players, I think. It is, it is a pity that he didn't get, you know, that he didn't stay and fight for his place, Derek, because I did think he was a very good player. And I thought that him and Lee Wallace had a fantastic understanding when, you know, the two of them were on their game. But, uh, you know, he's, he's away. He obviously wanted to go. He's, you know, the, the manager's, he's, the, the, he wasn't in the manager's plans. He obviously didn't quite see, you know, f- fancy him for his team. It's just, we've, we've basically just got to, you know, accept it, Derek. It's true what you say. It, was, it wasn't a great fee considering we were quoting him, you know, last season that being, you know, a player worth about four and five million pounds for him to go. No, we, were, we it, weren't. It was the media that were quoting that, remember. Yeah, well, I I think he will do quite well down in England because I don't think the Championship is as good as everybody makes out. I think he will, uh, you, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll play quite well down there and we'll just have to, have, have to wait and see. But... Uh, there's, there's not really much more that we can say about him, as you say. He's, he come away with the comments as well. You know, you would think a guy who had been with the club since he was a young boy, if he was told, you right, if you if, if you want to stay here, you'll have to train harder, then he would have said, right, I'll do whatever it takes. But, you know, he's, he's maybe seen the, 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 you know, the pound signs flashing as well. So I don't know what, what type of wages he'll be at. D- d- during the championship, he might be on a lot more than what, what he was with us at the moment. But it's just a pity the way that it's ended up, Derek. But we'll, we'll just have to grin and bear it, I'm afraid. Yep. Um, another player out is Matt Crooks. He's been sold to Northampton Town for under school's fee. Um, certainly he, when the, the rumours when he was signing for us, um, you know, he was meant to be the better of the two, Windass and Owen yeah. Windass and Crooks. And I've, I've, I think I've said before, I've heard from, from somebody who sat in the director's box and, you know, even under Warburton, you know, the, you know, he was meant to be diabolical even in training. So that's right. the reason why he went out. So, um, not a, a great loss there. We never really seen much of him. Anyway. No, we didn't. know so we can't we can't really comment on him to see if he was good, good or no, Derek. To be yeah. honest with you. Uh, next thing here, about a sad news: uh, Johnny Hubbard, club legend, suffered a heart attack uh, yeah. of, since we did the last podcast. However, yeah. fortunately, he appears to be doing fairly well now. Yeah, and he's excellent. Yeah. Up, so, uh, all, all good health to him. Hopefully. Yep. Next thing here is previous player Stephen Naismith uh, gave an interview to the BBC Scotland. Uh, it was a good interview. He came across pretty well, apologised and said he made a mistake in what he said and the way he went about things. He kind of shifted the blame a wee bit, saying that he was, you know, they were advised different things by different lawyers and, and, and stuff like that. Um, but certainly he did come across fairly well. Um, and obviously that's been a rumour all summer. Yeah, is, co- is, is he going to be coming back? Constantly, we're hearing it every day now, Derek. And we spoke about him before, so we'll we'll not go over that again. But uh, uh, he's just a name that just keeps cropping up all the time. So it's more the case of most fans. Most fans with a sensible head would take him back. I would have said, but had we been playing well and everything yes. was on the up, we would yes. take him. So exactly, you, you've got to look at it in two ways. He'll be yeah. a, he'll be a dick until he scores the winner. Um, you know, against Celtic or something like that. But, exactly. You know, um, there's no, there's no doubting he's a quality player, Derek, and there's no doubting he would make a big improvement to your team just now. But uh, that's the, the the only reason I would say that fans would want him back. Uh, and as you say, if the team was playing really well at the moment, scoring goals for fun, we would be saying, no, nah, no chance, we're, we're, we're not wanting them. But 
we really can't be picky at the moment, Derek. So we'll just it might not happen, uh, but his name just keeps cropping up all the time, doesn't it? Yep. Compare and contrast that to Whitaker, who's just signed for Hibs, who's came out and said he's no regrets. Yeah. Um, Maybe that's because he's signed already signed for a club and he's getting his his money. He doesn't need to yeah. come out and say that, whereas Naismith maybe did. But yeah, bearing in mind Naismith's still playing and now he's still signed for a yes. club. So, yep. um, also obviously what's came out in the news as well, uh, Kashina has put up a We Are the People banner uh, in the tunnel at Ibrox, uh, in and around different various places in Ibrox, knocking Howie and his band Green Boots, uh, yeah. as they are the colour of Celtic and he's defending the culture of Rangers. Right, um, I'm a bit of a baffling one with the boots anyway, Derek, I yeah. mean that's just a, you know, that should have absolutely nothing to do with it. Uh, but again, the media have pounced on it, Derek. It's a you know a negative again. The guy can't really do much right, you know, in the media's eyes. You know, take, t- taking away the way that the team's been playing and all that. A bit of a baffling one there. But nobody. I think what's annoying a, a lot of the the press and a lot of the the, the rival fans out there is they can't turn around and say that this is a sectarian act with the manager, <laughs> considering what religion he is, you know. And I think they're all very annoyed about that, Derek. To be honest with you, uh, so they're just put, putting it down to the fact that he's this crazy foreign guy that doesn't know, you know, have have a clue what he's doing. So, but they, I think they're genuinely annoyed that they can't use the sectarian part there uh, with the fact it's his decision you know Yep. Um, next thing here the last piece of football news is Paolo Vanoli, former player has yeah. joined the backroom staff at Chelsea yes uh, see to be honest with you Derek I can't really mind much about him uh, Paolo Vanoli, I can't, I can't really t- tell you if he was any good or no because I can't even remember much about him so maybe for him being a defender that's a good thing yeah. uh, I can't really remember him having any howlers for us but I can't remember him playing absolutely fantastic for us either so he, he must have been all, you know alright I don't know if you he's just he's he's one of these players that I just sort of skip you know I, I can't really remember much about can you? No I can't remember I remember the name and being a defender yeah. and that's about Aye. it you know, he, he, he was a fullback, but that that was about it. I, I can't really remember him, you know, contributing much. But at the same time, I can't remember slagging the guy off and saying that he was terrible. So, as you know, for, for a defender, that's always good. But uh, good good luck to him anyway. Uh, you know, going up, it's a fantastic move for him, and uh, you know, working alongside C- C- Conte at the moment, who's one of the best man, you know, coaches in the world. So, uh, fantastic stuff for him. Yep. So, um, moving on here, I do have a whole host of things, but given the fact that we're running quite late, um, right, okay. I will only pick the best couple. Right. The headline the here bit. is... The headline <laughs> so here it's, is... It's the way that you start to talk when you have to do these headlines. <laughs> you sound like a total perm when you do on your call. Grot Dog. <laughs> Waitress caught putting hot dog, hot dog, hot dog up her vagina before apparently <laughs> serving it to a customer. Hey, where you go? CCTV footage shows what appears to be a waitress alone in the kitchen after a chef has made a hot dog. But what happens next is shocking. After another colleague leaves, she can be seen clearly taking the sausage out of the bun, then pushing it into her vagina. <laughs> The unverified video has appeared on LiveLeak but offers very little explanation prompting <laughs> to wonder if it's real. See, to be fair, Derek, I can some guys that would be quite happy either. <laughs> <laughs> they also refer, it, refer to it as a tasteless stunt. Well, I, I don't know. Is that Raymond slang? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Next one. Man undergoes surgery to remove seven inch chopstick from his penis. <laughs> the man was too shy. To what? Oh, Derek, what is the explanation for this man? Come on. What the, are you, you need to give me an explanation for this. The man was too shy to go to the doctor about blood in his urine and disastrously took matters into his own hands by using the implements in a bid to rectify the problem. <laughs> I don't know why you would... As you would. (laughs) 
The man inserted chopsticks into his urethra, but stuck them in too far and he couldn't remove them. Doctors successfully removed them uh, after he took himself to hospital with the embarrassing problem. And the, but at the end of the day, Derek, did, did it clear the blood in the urine? Well, I don't know. <laughs> but if that is, you know, the way he was... I mean, why even think that that would stop it from happening? American Airlines plane evacuated after fas- farting passenger causes a stink. <laughs> People had to leave the aircraft due to foul-smelling odour, with the airline later blaming a mechanical error for the problem and denying a passenger had been lit and rip. That yeah, Derek, like one of our colleagues, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, Derek, what, uh, what airline was it? American. American Airlines. And what, what year was this, Derek? I hope it was the, a few few years ago when it was me that was flying on <laughs> American Airlines flight, no? No, that was, um, that was done. I, I thought you might have been de- doing that wee story that we covered with the boy that was shagging the... Oh, no, because you, <laughs> you spoiled it. That's why I put it on bloody line. <laughs> Did you not see what Ewan's response was? Is that no a story about Graham Spears, you know, with the thing that's been <laughs> <laughs> Aye, very good. Right, so that wraps up um, a, a very long episode of oh, the I Ready no. podcast. I know it was. We've uh, we've debated quite a bit, Derek, and uh, it's, it's just one of these things. It's been it's been a very difficult three weeks, considering how. Uh, you know how ecstatic we were about everything that happened uh, with the retail deal on that point Derek can I just say I want to thank uh, a lot of our listeners and followers on Twitter because I had guys in East Kilbride, I had a guy away up the north of Scotland, I had guy a guy down in England all checking various sports directs for a Rangers top for my wee boy and uh, at the end of the day, I was looking for an age 13. I couldn't get one anywhere. Uh, the only size that I could get was an age 14, and it turns out that after all this time, that an age 13 and 14 is exactly the same size, Derek. <laughs> so that was speaking to at least, you know, the, the staff in the mega store at Ibrox and at least six or seven different Sports Direct staff members and not one of them told me that when I asked if they had any age 13s. They basically said, no, we've only got 14s. And then it turns out that it was exactly the same size. So Shocking. he's got he's got his strip anyway, Derek. That's the main thing. Uh, and he was wearing it. He was uh, parading it about when we were doing in Blackpool uh, last week, just for we, we went down with the family for, for a couple of days. And the one thing that I would like to say is Blackpool... Uh, was basically royal blue because it was just Rangers tops everywhere. So it's great to see Derek. So that's that's the one thing. But as I say, it has been it's been difficult the last few weeks because we were on such a high and we were looking forward to the season so much. And then just that result in Europe has left us off flat and left a lot of people really angry and annoyed. So I just hope that we can turn we, we can turn it around now. And I do wish Pedro all the best. I know I've been saying that I'm not convinced in that but I do wish him all the best Derek I hope he gets it right and I hope all these players do t- turn it on uh, you know and we get a really sort of positive start to the season but we'll just have to wait and see what happens yes so all that's left to say is uh, check out our new website oh yep and check out our Twitter and check out our Facebook and check out our podcast <laughs> 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 right no bother, mate. Right. Take care. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye. Cheers. Bye.
Yeah, I will get into it if I can find where I've put the bloody um, file. 